Good morning, and welcome to our virtual Sunday morning worship service. The spiritual part of ourselves is sometimes referred to as a divine abyss. It is our deepest selves, a dimension that is not touched by words, thoughts, ideas, and feelings. Our bodies were made for perceiving the beauty of the world, a flower, a kiss, a stunning and vibrant green hillside, newborn baby, and yet all the art in the world cannot capture exactly what it feels like to experience the divine nature of these things. With all those thoughts swirling around us, we have taken a bit of time to connect with the deep part of ourselves and have chosen to join into virtual worship with the community of faith that first met Victoria. We thank you and we welcome you. As David said, we're here in Victoria. And for thousands of years, this land has been the traditional home of the Saanich, Songhee, and Esquimalt First Nations. We acknowledge with gratitude the beauty of this place and the stewardship of the Coast Salish people who hunted, fished, been in community since time immemorial on this land and in these seas. We commit ourselves to continue the work of healing, reconciliation, and seeking justice with the First Nations, the Métis Nations, and the Inuit people. Our service next Sunday, August the 8th, will mark the return to weekly in-person worship. We have been easing into this with a few services, with congregation in attendance, and singing of hymns. We will still socially distance and ask people to wear masks until seated, or people who wish to maintain minimal contact with others while still attending services. We have reserved the South Balcony, that's on the Balmoral, Balmoral Road side of the sanctuary. As we enter a new month, we send our congratulations and best wishes to First Met folks who are celebrating milestone birthdays and anniversaries in August. The list is on the screen and it's on our website at firstmetvictoria.com. The First Met men's group is meeting at Barb's Fish and Chips at Fisherman's Wharf on Monday, August 9th at 11.30. Partners are invited. There is more information on our website Please note the change in date and time for this occasion only. The Reverend Al Tissick is retiring. Reverend Al, as he's known around town, is no stranger to First Met through his years at our place and later the Dandelion Society, and we wish him all the best. And thank you very much to all the people who helped put together our summer devotional booklet. Marion Denton, and all the others you can see on your screen without whom this project would not have happened. You may have noticed a food truck parked at the church's Balmoral entrance on Saturdays. The operator of the truck is giving away food to unhoused members of the North Park community for a couple of hours on Saturdays. The First Med Board has approved the use of the parking lot space when the church is not open to allow this social program to take place. People continue to ask how they can obtain orange shirts to show support for First Nations communities. A supply has been ordered, and they will be sold to congregants when they arrive, possibly later this month. There is also information on the news page of our website on other ways to get a t-shirt. We will be having communion on August 22nd. Please see the screen or check our website. There is information on how to take communion if you're at home or even if you're with us here in the sanctuary. Firstmetvictoria.com for the website. We light our Christ candle a reminder of Christ lighting our darkness in ways that lead us forward. At home, 
you are invited to light a candle too. It will burn as a symbol of our intentions to live in ways that seek light, that reflect light, and that honor the light in others. This Christ candle can call us to a fresh start and a new beginning. May its light draw us and turn us always toward God's beloved community of justice and peace. We also light the candles of the four directions. They're a visual reminder to us of our global neighbors, God's love for all people, and of our need to build a community. On Ash Wednesday, we started a new tradition here at First Metropolitan by lighting our candle of hope. At home, please light your candle or turn on an electric one to create a virtual circle of hope. It is a reminder that we travel together in the spirit of God as we worship in our separate homes and seek reconciliation with all our relations. The spiritual part of ourselves is a divine abyss. It is a dimension that is not touched by words, thoughts, ideas, and feelings. Our bodies were made for perceiving the beauty of the world. A flower, a kiss, a stunning and vibrant green hillside, or a newborn baby. And yet all the art in the world cannot capture exactly what it feels like to experience the divine nature of these things. The path of unknowing is to both savor what the senses can take in, but also wonder the mystery of unfathomable depths of even a single atom. The path of unknowing is to both savor what the senses can take in, 
but also to wonder at the mystery of the unfathomable depths of even a single hour. Join me in prayer. Divine goodness, Holy One, pause us for this moment. Bear us up in this time. Hold us for all eternity. We offer ourselves in relationship with you. Help us to allow ourselves this love from you. We release ourselves into your presence. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of God. Sing praise, you who serve the Most High. We stand in the house of God, in the courts of God's house. Hallelujah. God is good. God, your name stands forever. Your fame is told from one generation to the next. That you do justice for your people, and you have compassion for your faithful. The idols of the nations are silver and gold the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but can't hear. There is never a breath on their lips. Their makers will come to be like them, and so will all who trust in them. House of Israel, bless God. 
priests of the temple, bless God. Attendants of the sanctuary, bless God. You who revere God, bless God. Blessings from Zion upon God who dwells in Jerusalem. Alleluia. This is part of our story. Thanks be to God. My name is Lisa Blay, and I'm a member of the Right Relations Resource Team and the Faith Formation and Outreach Minister at Trinity United Church in North Bay. I'm a Haudenosaunee woman living and working in North Bay, a city that is nestled between Lake Nipissing and Trout Lake, on lands and near waters that have sustained many indigenous peoples from time immemorial to the present. Anishinaabe, Cree, Algonquin, Ojibwe, Métis, and in recent history, settler peoples from many different nations have all the areas in and around the Apology and home. As people of the Apology, we seek to live together in peace and friendship, honoring the treaties, seeking justice, and walking together in the spirit of reconciliation. I'm very grateful to Lisa for sharing that introduction with us. We'll hear more from her next week. We are a people willing to walk a new way, and we thank all those folks right across Canada providing us with great leadership. I wanted to start my reflection today with a sort of sense, a little bit of what we see when we see these pictures here. You may be getting to recognize the person on the right there, Alberta Billy. You've heard her story a little bit in the last few weeks and her courage of standing up in 1981 to demand the church respond with an apology. Beside her in this picture is um, from Valcaris, Lorna standing ready. These are the names we need to know. When we are challenged, say their name. We want to be able to say the name of Alberta Billy and Laura standing ready. Two strong leaders as we learn to walk this new path. Their pictures will come up and maybe if you have a sense of a memory like a phone it'll come up at an odd time our phones do that you'll be turning your phone on in the morning and suddenly it'll tell you what you did three years ago or more 
and they'll say things like, this will only be shared with others with your permission, as if it was going to be something terribly naughty or a state secret from deep earth. But those pictures are sometimes quite mundane. I often take pictures of where I park my car. I don't like to lose my car in a car park, so I park, take a picture of my car, and I don't always remember to delete those photos. So sometimes Google will say, do you remember this exciting event that took place? And, you know, at some deep level of a car park in downtown. But sometimes um, there are other pictures that make you smile. The other day, for some reason, I got a grand my grandson Nicholas's picture came when he was just in preschool, Nick's finished high school now, and it did make me smile to see that little face. And um, just, I uh, guess the day before yesterday, I got a reminder of something we used to have on Bowen Island at Snug Cove, our harbor. And if you've ever gone there by ferry, that's where you would have landed. We used to have something called steamship days, and we would all wear white. And on that day, we listened to Dal Richards. Really, Dal Richards was there on Bowen playing with his big band. And that is also a moment that makes you smile to remember it. Not a mundane thing, a kind of a connection with a treasured memory, solid memory. And then a photo will come up. And it's as if your camera is saying to you, hey, do you remember when you saw the glaciers in Alaska three years ago? As if you could ever forget the blueness of that ice or the roar of the calving as it crashed into the water not just a great memory, not just a smile, but a heart treasure. Seeing the glaciers in Alaska is one of those heart treasures for me. You could call it, for me, an experience of wordless wonder, where all you said at the time was, wow, did you see that? Wow. This huge wave comes as that mammoth piece of ice crashes into the water and it stops you in your tracks and at that moment you don't notice well, well for me it was hundreds of people around me speaking different languages all of them seeing an angle on the same thing I was seeing because I was lost in wonder just like that old hymn says lost in wonder watching this happen the color of that ice was so startling. We're, I still can't find the right words. If you haven't seen it, I haven't done a very good job of explaining it. I know because words can only kind of give you 5% of what it was like to see that, especially for the first time. Kind of a double wow. And all that time, all the times I've been up to Alaska and seen that, it hasn't lost its sense of sacred moment for me. I'm so keen to see those glaciers while they're still there. I despair the loss of them. And when I was there that first time and I realized I might have it again, I spent time at the, at the edge there scanning the ice, scanning to see if I would see a crack and hear that roar. And then one time, about five years ago, we were rewarded for being scanning, which is three humpback whales came up in the water between our ship and the glaciers. And I kind of thought, it doesn't get much sweeter than this. I'm sure that you've had that moment when you've seen a ballerina do something, you think, wow. Like, at one point, you may be thinking, how did she do this? How many hours has she practiced? How can she stand on those little tiny shoes? And then you go to that next place, that lost in wonder place, that depth of response. Right now, we were watching the Tokyo Olympics, and I'm sure you've seen that and seen some of those aquatic teams and acrobats and different people, and you know there's hundreds of hours, and there have been injuries, and heartbreak and disappointments, but you see them work through a routine flawlessly as it appears to you. And you just say, wow. Those moments of being lost in wonder. 
And those wor wordless wonder moments can describe our relationship with our Holy Creator, the Holy One. So, of course, people call it the cloud of unknowing, that God is our cloud of unknowing, because we don't have words. We just end up fumbling around as I am this morning. It was Blaise Pascal 500 years ago who first came up with that phrase of God as the infinite abyss. The divine abyss is how Marcia McPhee talked about it when we saw her earlier introduction to this service. It's the place below words or deeper than feelings. And it can be caused by many things. There's no one thing. I'm sure other people on the boat seeing the glaciers were going, oh, is that all? Maybe what time's the lunch? It happens, doesn't it? You're there lost in wonder and somebody else is thinking, I wonder what. It's just the way life is. We're all so unique. And we don't have it in common, but we do have something in common, which is we can't easily communicate exactly what it feels like to experience the divine in life. Hence the phrase, the abyss, the unknowing. How do you explain the divine nature of things? Flowers, driftwood, candles. Sometimes God is such a mystery beyond our comprehension, beyond our articulation, and to a place where we don't need to try to articulate. We're content somehow given that momentary glimpse, right? We are content just to experience God. And it's a, it's a sparkle, it's a shimmer, and then it is gone. But in that moment, too deep for words, we have experience, we know it. The divine mystery of our God, our Holy One. So we, in our attempt to describe, uh, try to describe sacred worth, we talked about that last week, of, say, the glaciers or the people that live near them. And we find ourselves divided on what is of sacred worth because it is so hard in our culture to say everybody has sacred worth. All places have sacred worth. Dr. Farley, who wrote the book this series is based on, Beguiled by Beauty, she says racism is when we reduce people to categories rather than seeing them as sacred worth. And we've been learning about systemic racism in the last year. Systemic racism, of course, is just systems where it's okay not to see the sacred worth in individuals or groups of people. And we've been learning about that across Canada, across British Columbia, and even across Victoria, where people are acting out of that. The images coming out of the residential schools have res often reduced us to wordlessness, a kind of hollowed out wow. Not the ecstatic wow of the glaciers, but a tragic wow. As you see the markers on those graves in that green grass. So we can lose our sense of beauty and sacred worth when we don't see them sacred worth of all people. Or that the world is a chance for us to participate fully in sacred stewardship. And so we can turn to that sad and broken part of us that says it's only important if it matters to me, it's only important if it helps me, if I'm the benefactor, if their life is to serve me. In the Lectio today, in the Psalm, in the middle of that praise and attribution, Suddenly there was this little paragraph about idols, and it felt kind of jarring, even though David did read it beautifully. But idolatry happens in many ways, but one of the ways it happens, as identified in the psalm, is when we start valuing things for what they can give us, even God. When we see ourselves as the most important part of creation and that everything else is here to serve us, even the divine one. So idolatry can be our trap when the idol we worship is our comfort zone, our freedom not to be challenged, not to have to change. 
So we go back to the words and the advice and the instincts of Dr. Farley, who's a second or third generation theologian, deeply immersed in the work. She invites us to ground ourselves differently, to uh, not to be derailed when we can't put our wow into words, and not to be derailed when we see and experience the things of others, not valuing the sacred worth of others, but to ground ourselves as seeing our world unconnected to being a benefit to us, save we get to experience its sacred nature together. Sacred in ourselves, in our relationship with other equally sacred beings, other people we don't know, we don't speak their language or share their culture, equally sacred to the Creator. She suggests we ground ourselves in that and that we might well find that healing. I remember hearing my dad talk about the weekend that his, grand, his father died. I never met my grandfather. He died in Edmonton. And on my father's travel to be there with his mom, he said he found himself looking at the areas he was going through and find, unbidden, thinking that this is the glory of God, these beautiful sights somehow were a gift to him in ways that he wasn't seeking, and not in the glib way. You know, it's beautiful if you just look for the beauty, but somehow, somehow his spirit was touched, and the grief was lessened, not revealed, not removed, rather, and not um, reduced beyond its, its reality. His dad had just suddenly died. But in that gift from nature, the gift of sacred stewardship, helped him as he made that tragic trip. So we pray together as a congregation, coming into a new reality starting next Sunday, that the sacred nature of life around us and within us will be a resource as we have to continually change in the months ahead. I believe that as we stay grounded, we'll be able to live a life of courage and a life of hope and a life of trust. I'm sure you've gone to camp, or if you ever have heard anybody come home from a Christian camp, they have little things they do with their fingers, about praying with different fingers. And one has to do with the word worship, W-O-R-S-H-I-P. When our reality seems hard, invoke praise. When our reality seems hard, invoke praise. St. Paul did, said that in Philippians, you know, to think on the things that are beautiful and true, and so when our lives are hard in the days ahead, we are invited to invoke praise, something of sacred beauty around you, something of sacred beauty within you. Amen.
Let us pray. Creating Spirit, we acknowledge that as your handiwork, we stand alongside all that you have made. Trees and rivers, mountains and valleys, soaring birds and scuttling creatures, all are held within your care. Eternal God, whose Spirit moved over the face of the deep, bringing forth light and life, by that same Spirit, Renew your creation and restore your image in your people. Creator of our common home, you fill the earth and sea and sky with life. Forgive us our neglect of your creation, the choking waste of our pollution, the damage done by careless habits, and our indifference to future generations. Help us to amend our lives to refuse more plastic if we can't reuse it, to lift our voice for lasting change, and to live well and gently on the earth. And thus we pray, turn us from careless tenants to faithful stewards, that your threefold blessing of clean air, pure water, and rich earth may be the inheritance of everything that has the breath of life and one generation may proclaim to another the wonder of your works. As we pray for this injured earth, we lift up all situations on our hearts. We pray for those who are lost, are lonely, are stricken in this pandemic. Through Jesus Christ, in whom your glory is revealed. Amen. As we come to the last page of this chapter in the worship life of this congregation, I want to pause and give thanks to those who have followed along online, wishing they could be with us here in the sanctuary, and to give thanks to the people in the sanctuary right now who have made it possible for us in the last 16 months to bring worship to all those places and times that you have found us through YouTube. To Kelly and today's songbird, Annalise, we thank you. To David, and the, who has done the lion's share of lecturing um, during the entire pandemic, also in the early months shared with Leanne Clark. And at the back of the room, our student who was and continues on as our friend, Trison, 
Joan, the head of the communications team at the back, and our student Jody. Earlier on, we had Peter, and before Peter, we had Ryan. We have been blessed with a great team of co-op students here, and Joan and David have been the head of that program. And so we turn a corner, one that we cannot wait to turn, but we pause and we give thanks for all that we have been able to do from this sanctuary through the gifts given to us by those who went before and those who continue to walk with us. I should also remember, remember to mention Bruce, our custodian, who's done so much for so long. And so I hope you are enjoying this long weekend. Hope that you are safe and that if visits are happening, that they are indeed joyful occasions for you. The world is varied and beautiful. Seek wisdom wherever it is to be found. And may the goodness of the Creator, the companionship of the Christ, and the insight of the Spirit infuse your life now and always.